for our next talk, which I'm very excited about, which is a special format, because I have the great privilege of getting to do a fireside chat with two members of the NetHack dev team. Uh, so welcome to the stage, Jesse Colette and Kenny. Hello. Morning. You know, very glad to be I, here. I, I, I tried to pitch having like a, a hooded figure kind of visual effect to really lean into the, <laughs> the secrecy, but it, it's great to just, you know, have you here to chat. Um, and I'll, I'll say for people in, in the discussion, since this is an AMA, I'll be keeping an eye on, on questions as we talk. So um, please submit those. Don't just wait till the end. This is a, a discussion. But let's kick off by just kind of some introductions and, and maybe a bit of, you know, what was your you know history as a member of the NetHack Dev team, you know, things you contributed to, how you got into it. Um, you can start with you, Kenny. Oh, OK. So um, I get into NetHack uh, through uh, Rogue, and then in grad graduate school, I was porting everything I could to the Amiga uh, because I had a bunch of friends I had forced to buy Amigas instead of Apples, and I needed to prove to them that <clears throat> this computer could handle all this stuff. And so I hit NetHack in uh, Comp Sources Games, and it didn't work. And this was my first experience with the, uh, well, I guess it'd be called a meme these days, of uh, NetHack breaks compilers. Uh, I also broke the compiler on the Cray with NetHack. Um, and many people have done it with other things. Uh, but through the discussion uh, with dev team uh, about that bug, uh, I ended up on the Amiga porting team. And I did that for years and years. And then as the Amiga was peter petering out, the uh, the web was coming in. So I moved over to uh, building our website and then more email tools and backend stuff. And I occasionally dip myself my toe into the uh, main part of the game. Excellent. Um, Jesse, how about you? Oh, I uh, skipped Rogue. <coughs> I think I started directly with Hack, if I remember correctly. Um, I was um, uh, very young, <laughs> much younger than now, obviously. Uh, and uh, yeah, I discovered um, computer games on Unix systems, uh, either at uh, uh, companies I worked for at uh, universities. Uh, at the time, you know, personal computers were kind of a rarity and certainly didn't have access to that much games. Um, and uh, like uh, like Kitty, you know, the first thing I did was to port it on some system that uh, didn't support it. So, uh, and uh, I put that time NetHack uh, 2.3 came out, uh, which was a direct descendant of Hack. And I, uh, I uh, really, uh, got into it and started porting it to wherever I needed to port. And uh, one thing led to another, you know, fix bugs. And, uh, and I, you have to remember that at the time, the community was working in a very different way. You had, we had uh, Usenet uh, with uh, or the equivalent of built-in board. So whenever you posted, you, you fixed a bug, you posted the diffs. You know, the, <laughs> here's, the here's, a, here's a fix for that particular bug or that kind of thing. Then, once you do that, you know, after that, you start having your own ideas route or to improve the game. So you start posting suggestions with the code because you've tested it and so on. And I did a number of uh, patches like that. And uh, that's how I got contacted by uh, uh, by the uh, yet, uh, at that time, nascent dev team. Uh, that was 1988. So, uh, you know, within the first year of the creation of NetHack. And I joined the team to start working on NetHack 3.0. Uh, which was the very the, the, the first version with a really full dev team at the time. And I stayed active for quite a long time, um, let's say about uh, 12, 13 years. Uh, and uh, around the turn of the uh, century, <laughs> they told ourselves, <laughs> um, I kind of drift off, but I still stayed connected to, uh, uh, to the team. Uh, so I'm 
still technically part of the dev team. Uh, I still get the emails you know, whenever anybody sends suggestions or that kind of things, but I haven't contributed anything in 20 years, basically, except maybe some discussions and stuff like that. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And I think that, yeah, the, the format of the dev team is both kind of familiar to like, you know, some people still are doing high open source and have their Git repos, but also is kind of unique. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, how did that work in terms of deciding to take, you know, what directions to take that pack in? You know, is it a lot of discussions within the dev team? Are there certain people who kind of own that? And over time, is it a lot of people coming and going? Or, or were they kind of passing the torch of like, okay, now you are going to start taking charge of this element? Uh, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's also a, one that is very hard to, uh, uh, to actually um, uh, answer because it, it, I suppose it depends a lot on that, what time period you're looking at. Uh, but uh, for the time I was in the team, uh, there was uh, no real a leadership, so to speak. Nobody was deciding what uh, what the others would do and so on. Uh, we were discussing ideas over email, basically, and uh, usually these ideas would come up in the form of, uh, hey, here's what I could, what do you think about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, then usually it would, uh, it would evolve from there. Um, what I realized much later on in, uh, in my life is that it was actually very close to what the improv uh, mechanisms are, which is, you know, now that I look back at it, we never said no or but, we always said yes and, you know, and you you try to improve on what was done. And there were, so, and that's why I always insist on saying that, you know, NetAC is first and foremost a collaborative project. Nobody uh, on any part of the code, nobody on any part of the features, everybody worked on anything, basically. And when I say everybody, uh, there is a dev team, but we got so many contributions from all over the place that it's very hard to keep track of that. Right. Okay. So from my point of view, I guess the time frames are just a little different. Uh, I came in when Iscock Miller was uh, our librarian. I think that was even his term for it. Um, he's not a programmer. He was. Uh, he was in charge of the source tree, which at that point in time was sitting on some computer at the University of Pennsylvania. And if you needed a new copy, he would uh, make a copy and mail it to you uh, as a large tarball. Wow. Uh, other than that, it was up to you to keep up with your email and apply patches. And when they started failing, you got to start again. Yeah, no Git at the time. <laughs> yeah, right, of course. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 true what you said. Each hack was very much the um, the moderator of the team in many ways. Uh, he was, if I remember correctly, a professor in philosophy. So that gives <laughs> you an idea of uh, his background. He was a, a great guy, and uh, I, I miss him terribly. Uh, yes. To be fair, uh, <laughs> but he, he he was much more the uh, the, the, the stabilizing core of the team than somebody who would tell you what to do and what not to do. You know? I, I keep waiting to find out that he's, he's left a book uh, you know, <laughs> peering at us as lab rats. Let's see what happens if we try to develop a game in using this organizational format. <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. I think a librarian is, is a beautiful term for that. And I think it, it is amazing that, you know, a lot of projects have failed due to kind of lack of structure and things like that. So for it to stay so collaborative, and I think that's very beautiful too, of, you know, and when I first got in touch with you, Jesse, you told me about how, you know, I, I think that sometimes the like community kind of jokes about the NetHack the dev team being kind of secretive and things. And you were like, no, it's more about like embracing the fact that it's not just a select set of people who built NetHack and it's this community effort. And I think that that's a really, you know, yeah. a lovely way to think of it. Yeah, I, I can tell you that, you know, when you send that mail initially uh, asking if you wanted to speak anonymously, uh, it got a good laugh in the team, you know. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I think it's more obviously collaborative now, but it's, it's always been attached 
uh, pretty pretty uh, sturdily to uh, at least those people who are who are willing to reach out to us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. yeah. To give you an, uh, an example, uh, recently NEDAC got uh, added to the collection of the Museum of Modern Art of uh, New York. And when the curator asked us, you know, what should we attribute it to, uh, we really all, without any discussion whatsoever, we all knew that it would have to be the, the net act left in period, nobody else. And yeah. that's really important to us. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think that, that that is wonderful. And that's why I am glad to get to do this is because then, um, you know, so many people have been inspired by NetHack and want to know more about kind of the history and the development. And that's where I think there's some interest in being able to hear some of the stories and get that. I mean, a lot of people in this community have done, you know, scraping of Usenet. I know people who would kill to read those emails of the like, yes, and development of, of NetHack over time. Because, um, I wish I had kept them, yes, I can tell you yes. that. <laughs> it was a lot harder to keep that stuff at the time. So. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll grab a question from the audience here from Yanez. Um, so it's about just the fact that like there are so many community projects that you know build off of NetHack, and, and you know obviously in the past there are really forks and, and everything, but even currently, like I don't know if you've heard of like Facebook is created this environment to train AI agents on playing NetHack because their argument was that NetHack is this super rich game that's not very resource intensive. So it's something that, you know, they can work with, but just has so much complexity. Like, how, how does it feel? You know, have you heard things of that? Like, how do you feel about the idea that these even huge companies are using NetHack as this just like perfect example of, of this really unique game? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Kenny, because I'm um, lost there. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Uh, people shouldn't feel afraid to contact us. And, you know, if you... If you have some piece of news like that, you know we'll add it to the web page. Uh, it, it's. Um, I actually went to the uh, MoMA opening with my wife, and we've been married twenty five years. But I think uh, getting into MoMA and being there, and seeing other developers of much more visually exciting games, um, like NetHack. Oh wow. That's so important in my life. You know, it just, just gave her a, a a better perspective on. Um, I'm I'm not just wasting my time completely. Uh, and, and honestly, it was it was good for me too because we don't get the. I don't think we get the feedback that uh, that we could because we spend all our time writing it and not so much uh, sitting around in chat rooms. Uh, listening to people talk about it. Yeah, it's uh, actually, I, I, I realized something uh, leading up to uh, to that talk that I was uh, uh, reminiscing all that. And uh, what struck me that NetHack didn't become um, kind of famous uh, until very late in its lifetime. Um, until I'd say the uh, late 90s, you know, uh, we only heard from the community uh, directly through rec.games.ac and that kind of things. Uh, but then around the mid 90s, the late 90s, we started getting queries from journalists who wanted to write articles, uh, the people, who, uh, authors who wanted to write books and so on. And uh, that was, you know, kind of, wow, how did that happen, you know? Uh, are you sure they're talking about, you know, NEDAC? <laughs> it's not, they're not confusing with something else. And, and, and I think that to me, the, the, the day it really dawned on me is when we received a mail from Blizzard, uh, Blizzard North at the time, uh, who sent us an email saying that, you know, when they pitched Diablo to their management, they said, we want to do NetHack with graphics and sounds. And that they had been uh, inspired by that. And uh, I, I looked at it and I had played Diablo like crazy at the time. So I looked at that mail and my mind was just blown. So really, <laughs> and uh, it's another one of these emails I wish I had kept. God, <laughs> sometimes yeah. you're stupid, you know? <laughs> well, I'm glad to have this event because it is. I mean, NetHack is, is so 
beloved and, and a huge influence. And, you know, yeah, it still like comes up constantly. I mean, and actually, you know, I'll turn this into a question because we had yesterday uh, a talk from Kess about the async and the provenance of the encyclopedia entries of NetPath and, and spending time tracing back the particular entry for the async, uh, which, you know, people spend all this time to, to try and, you know, dig into that through this love for it, which I, I'm curious actually, did either of you ever contribute anything to stuff like the encyclopedia? Like, you know, how, was there a chance did lots of people kind of throw in of like, oh, let, let's do this monster. Oh, let's have like a reference to this or um, was it more some people were really into that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, oh, OK. Well, I actually uh, dug through the uh, commits. And a lot of what I did happened before we got to uh, Git or even subversion. Yeah. So exactly what line you know, is mine long gone. <laughs> um, some of my jokes are in there. Uh, I never did anything like a monster. Uh, it's uh, just not the way I tend to approach things. Um, I, I am responsible for the uh, rip screen on the Amiga that has a moving moon. Um, it's uh, really terrible because I am not an artist. But uh, I think that was the first not completely ASCII art uh, rip screen. Wow, amazing. Yeah, just you know, little things that have gotten lost. Uh, uh, I think I did fake mail, though I couldn't prove it from the history we've got. <laughs> Can you explain uh, fake mail briefly? Um, oh, uh, well, once upon a time, if you run NetHack on a uh, system that you're sharing with 500 of your friends, when you get mail, you can when you get email in your mailbox, uh, it will show up as a scroll in NetHack. You would have the, e the mail demon actually show up. Yes. Yeah, mail demon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And uh, when I moved NetHack to the Amiga, uh, I missed that. You know, it was the occasional interruption that was just kind of fun. So I just, I believe it was me. Uh, I just added this thing that uh, just triggered the mail demon relatively randomly and a bunch of uh, pieces of mail that obviously aren't real because can't extract the mail from a PC <laughs> real well. That's wonderful. I, especially, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you play, there's NetHack that you can play in the browser. And I believe there's a way to send messages to people who are playing NetHack in the browser and like look into their game. And then it uses the mail system to deliver that message. Uh, so that's been Have repurposed. I love that. I had completely forgotten about the mail demon, which <laughs> which tied as a as a you know Unix joke because the mail demon is what uh, on Unix uh, distribute emails. So. Uh, it, if you don't remember that, then nobody's going to remember most of what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Some of us remember uh, uh, people at this conference. Uh, yeah. How how many people have dug into the three point seven code enough to? know that I added sandboxing to Lua uh, <laughs> <laughs> or the, uh, you know, the crash not, report stuff. Not very user facing, is it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, or, or actually, uh, the data librarian, uh, the code that's in there is not mine, but the original concept was. Nice. N not, yeah. yeah, not the kind of user facing stuff that people um, no, but really no net crucial hack. for it for it to run, especially you know net hack. I, I was I was very amazed and impressed. I, I worked in the source code, um, and I had a talk actually once that was a, a guide to reading the source code of net hack, just because there's so many amazing comments and really clever functions. My favorite was uh, string kitten instead of string cat for concatenating one character. But um, you know, they're, they're, it was lovely, but I was I was surprised by just how much code is in there for porting and supporting so many different systems, which makes a lot of sense um, given just like the community nature of it. But like, yeah, there's so much work in there that you know oh, people yeah. don't see it other than the fact that they see NetHack runs on their system, whatever their system is. It was a hiv def nightmare yeah, for a long time. <laughs> just going through the code and. Uh... Because you, you you had ifdef closes for porting, but also also for certain features that could be turned on and off. And you know, after a while, you say we said, okay, let's uh, let's stop with that nonsense. And we 
made some of these optional features completely permanent so that we, we wouldn't have to deal with that anymore. But yeah, initially that was. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll grab another audience question. This is from Ingress, which is just what character class is your favorite? I guess either to play or conceptually. Uh, I honestly play whatever it brings up uh, under random because I honestly don't play much these days. Yeah. Uh, if I if, if I want to do something with NetHack, I want to change it, add something to it. Uh, if I'm playing it, it means I'm debugging something specific. So um, I don't know, if you want Hi. stories, how, how frustrated I get uh, actually playing something like NetHack, uh, I managed to get my hands on a tandem that was uh, being uh, decommissioned and had root privileges on that for a while. And, sorry, it was a pyramid, not a tandem. And the first thing I did was I built a version of Rogue with a you know, like a plus fifty broadsword and plus fifty armor, just so I could see how it went. You know, after the first couple levels. But, yeah, I don't actually play much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I ended up in the same situation uh, uh, in the later years. I I uh, played more and more for debugging and testing purposes than actually playing itself. Uh, if I remember, uh, I used to favor the knight, mostly because I usually would go after Excalibur, you know, so yeah. Yeah. kind of fit. Huh? Yeah, I play Valkyrie, same reason, want Excalibur. <laughs> um, here's another question, I think we touched on it a bit, but are there any other from uh, Unknown Sense Bird contributions or systems that you're personally proud of, no matter how kind of back-end and invisible they might be? Well, in my case, I think the, um, the biggest thing I uh, I remember starting, because you know, again, you know, it's, you start something, you don't, <laughs> you don't do it, uh, were the, uh, the special levels. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, uh, NetAct was just completely uh, uh, gener procedurally generated and, uh, and uh, uh, since we were trying to tell stories a lot in there, you know, because a lot of inspiration from NEDA comes from literature and so on, uh, I wanted to uh, start to add some, you know, pre-designed environments. Uh, and, uh, and the challenge was um, multiple, because uh, once, uh, the first one was you don't want to lose the randomness, what makes the interest uh, the, the the game what it is is you know that every playthrough is different. If you start to have hardcore levels, it lowers that uh, that fun. So how can I have you know preconceived uh, pre-designed environment in a random environment while keeping you know that that part? And that's what the uh, what I what we used to call at the time the level compiler. Uh, and the reason we went with a compiler is that we didn't want to leave um, uh, too much hints on the file systems because uh, multi-user systems and so on, people could read the files, so they would have uh, hints about that. So everything was compiled in advance. On top of that, you know, avoid uh, compiling, you avoid, uh, you catch errors early instead of during runtime. And uh, so I designed the very first level like that, which was a, uh, the castle uh, at the bottom of the uh, normal uh, dungeon. And later on, the one that I'm really proud of was uh, Vladstar. Yeah, because uh, I, I remember reading uh, years and years later that it was the most uh, uh, evil part of NEDAC for a long for a lot of people because uh, at the time I wanted really to break the idea that you know each level is completely independent from the previous one. So I got the idea of uh, uh, having something that spread over three levels or more. If I remember that was three. Um, but to get to the top level of the tower, you had first to start uh, to enter at the bottom level. And so uh, I had to create a, 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 I had to take into account a number of things. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, the first part was that, okay, how do I stop them from getting to the top level 
uh, without going through the bottom. So, you know, digging walls, uh, teleporting, all that kind of thing. So I had to add a lot of mechanisms to prevent that kind of stuff. Uh, and then we have the stairs problem. Where at the time, it was very st straightforward. You know, you take the stairs down, you generate the next level, you look where the stairs up are, and you put the player there, down. Well, once you have two stairs, one outside the tower, one inside the tower, you have a problem. So I, I went with a hack, for lack of a better word. I introduced ladders. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, that way I would connect two ladders and the stairs would connect to the stairs and that was it. You know, but uh, that triggered a discussion that came up to a new design for the stairs where we could now connect stairs between levels and that led later on to a branches system to uh, the branches in the dungeons. So that's what I mean by the yes and, you know, because I didn't do that part, but that that kind of evolved that way. And uh, that's a really, uh, I got really fond memories of all that work. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, what about you, Kenny? Do you have any other particular moments that you're especially proud of? Oh, um... I've mentioned most of what's still there. But one thing maybe I'll mention for history bus uh, is something that never got saw the light of day. Uh, the Amiga port was starting to run out of RAM. Uh, so the PC port had uh, an overlay system. So I went and wrote an overlay system for the Amiga, but I didn't like how intrusive the uh, PC port, the, the PC uh, overlay system was. You had every function needed a declaration about where it was going, and it was um, a frequent uh, cause of breakage. Unfortunately, the way I did this was to run the source code through a modified version of GCC that would figure out where everything had to go and set up the tables and rewrite the code to, to do that. Uh, then we went to think about distributing this. I asked Jim Stallman, well, is this okay? I need to send th this one file from GCC. And he says, no, you have to send the entire GCC distribution. <laughs> and since at that point, uh, distributing right. NetHack was already something that required uh, a lot of coordination with uh, the moderators for comp sources games because it was the largest thing that got distributed uh, by, I don't know, factor of five or ten, depending on the year. Um, the, the idea of making it 10 times larger so this one port could have this one file. Just for the Amiga. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that never happened, but it did work. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Now everyone knows. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you got a chance to, to share. Um, I'll ask one question I think is fun. Um, you know, one of the most famous phrases I think associated with NetHack is the dev team thinks of everything. How does that feel when you're on the dev team? Uh, it's a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. But yeah, every every time I see a, a, a patch go by, because internally, we're, while we're using Git, it does get mailed to us. So we have a chance to comment on each individual thing or fork a discussion. Each time I see a patch go by, it's like, OK, but what if you did this in this situation? And you know, sometimes I'll send email about that, which people will generally reject. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes I'll write a piece of code. And, uh, yeah. But yeah, it, it's, uh, I look at it as a challenge. Actually, you'd be surprised that initially, you know, uh, we would be very surprised at what uh, uh, the players would attempt and uh, report on, you know. And so uh, a lot of the uh, dev team thinks of everything is kind of uh, uh, taking credit for other people's suggestions or even, you know, trying to do something. Uh, one of my favorite one uh, was the, um, uh, the, the, the polypiling method. I don't know if you remember that one. Of course. 
uh, we didn't see that one coming at all. I can tell you that <laughs> for, for for sure. You know uh, that uh, players would start piling up ones on top of each other and zap a one of polymorph on them to try to get more ones of polymorphs. And uh, and we didn't see that one coming. But when we saw it, we say, okay, yeah, that's smart, and we want to. Uh, we don't want to, you know, stop that. It wouldn't be fair. But we have to balance it. So uh, that's when we added the possibility of disintegrating the objects uh -huh. when zapping a wand, because a wand of polymorph, because then you have a uh, you have a risk that comes with the uh, with that, plus the limited amount of charges on wands of polymorphs. Uh, yeah. But uh, that's very much what I was saying about the uh, yes and. You know, we exactly. would take all that stuff coming in and we'd say we'd say first ask first question is does it make sense? If it makes sense, then how can we make it work? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's beautiful. And I, I love that that's still a lesson people can can take today. And that I think, yeah, it explains a lot of how NetHack got to where it is. And it's been, it's very neat to see how it is like an evolving process. Like it got to the point it is because of so many people working together in the community and the developers. So thank you. We are at time. Um, and, I, and I will say to end off, I want to just say thank you in terms of I got started at Roguelike Celebration talking about NetHack. I got into Roguelikes playing NetHack. And my, my mother wanted to say thank you sincerely because she plays NetHack. That's how I got into it. And actually, she told me I probably wouldn't exist without NetHack because she started dating my father because he had a computer that if she started dating him, she'd be able to play NetHack on his computer. So I wouldn't be here without NetHack <laughs> in, in many ways. Uh, it's not my story to tell, but that is not the only uh, marriage associated with NetHack. <laughs> my fiance and I went to the NetHack MoMA uh, together. So um, I may also end up with you as a marriage <laughs> if I do the NetHack. <laughs> But thank you so much for being here. This is really special. And uh, yeah, just thanks so much for taking the time. And, and I'm glad to get the chance to be kind of a, a, a voice for the community that just is so thankful for all the work that you did on this wonderful game. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was great to be there. I always uh, just love to talk about NEDAC. It's been a yes. huge part of my life. And uh, I can't shut up about it when they get me started. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me too. All right, well, thank you.